All right, who's ready for some hot topics? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. And happy Sunday, fun day. This is my favorite day of the week. And the devil hates Sunday. All right, how many of you are happy, happy, happy? We're starting a new series today, and it is called Hot Topics. And this series is chosen by you guys. Every Easter, we do a survey, and I ask you, what do you want to hear taught on? And then, uh, usually in the month of September, I take your feedback and create the Hot Topics series. And this year, you chose three things, and the first one is what we're going to cover today. Um, But let me start in reverse. The the third one is... um, what is the third one? Oh, how to, how to overcome worry and anxiety, which is actually a repeat from what you picked last year. So I don't guess I taught on it good enough last year. and You're still struggling with anxiety, but we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. And next week, we're going to talk about how to discover God's plan for your life. Who wants to know God's plan for your life, right? And then uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, hope and healing. And this one I grappled with the most because I thought there's so many different ways we could approach this topic of hope and healing. Uh, Should we talk about physical healing? Should we talk about, you know, how to uh, hope in the face of struggle or defeat and all these different things? And so uh, what I finally settled on is the message that I'm going to bring you today. And I title it this, how to have a positive outlook in a negative world. Because how many know there's a few negative things happening in our world. I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but there are. Uh, How many of you watch the news? Anybody? Yeah, I don't either because (laughs) it's just no good news, man. I watch the news maybe once a month because that's that's all I need because it doesn't change a whole lot. So anyway, but I I do read my Bible every day and that's good news. So I'm going to share some good news with you today. So we're going to talk about hope and healing. Let me give you a quick definition of hope. Um, If we had a target set up over here and I I did this one time, I had a target and I had a guy in our church who's a bow hunter and he came in and he, he shot his arrow across and he, man, first shot, man, just bullseye. He's, he's really good. But Hope sets the target, but faith is when you pull the trigger. So it's great to have a target, you know, if you aim at nothing, right? You hit it every time, but it's no good to have a target if you never pull the trigger. So hope is the target. That's what we're aiming at. And faith is what we're, the action is what we're believing for. It's how, it's when you pull the trigger, so to speak. So we're going to talk about hope today, but we're also going to talk about an attitude of faith an attitude of faith. So I do have a text for today, and it's in the book of Job. Job chapter 3 and verse 25. It's spelled J-O-B, but it's pronounced, spelled Job, pronounced Job. Uh, I had a guy years ago, he got born again in our church, and he he said, well, I I decided I need to start reading the Bible now that I'm a Christian. So he goes, I figured, well, I need a job, so I'll start there. Well, it's not pronounced job, it's pronounced Job. But anyway, but if you need a job, you could read that and it wouldn't hurt you any. So anyway, Job chapter 3 and verse 25, and it says this, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. So fear opens doors just like faith opens doors. And so... Um, I'll, let me go back to hope. Hope is like worry in reverse. Worry is when you ponder something in your mind, often something that is probably not going to happen or wouldn't have happened had you not thought about it. But, but, when you, but what you meditate on is what you gravitate towards. And so, again, fear and faith both open doors to our lives. So here we go. Let me just share a few little thoughts that I jotted down before we get into our points. What we fear, we attract. So if you're taking notes, write that down. And what we believe, we attract. What we fear, we attract. So worry seems to be like the only sin that Christians aren't afraid to commit. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> They're like, yeah, sure, I'll worry about that. But, uh, I mean, we used to fear God, now it's like we fear everything else. <clears throat> but how many know if you fear God, you don't really fear much else? Amen. Sometimes our bodies physically cannot begin to recover, and, and the natural healing process can't accelerate until our mind allows it. you got to get your mind right before everything else can get right. So we cannot achieve success, overcome temptation, emerge victorious through tests and trials until we have a proper mindset. Everybody say mindset. Mindset. So today I want you to become a possibilitarian. 
A possibilitarian is a word that my aunt made up years ago because she was a sesquipedalian, which is actually a real word, and look it up. But anyway, uh, a possibilitarian is someone who thinks, yeah, all things are possible. Say, I'm one of those. So today, that's my hope. Because how many know, sometimes if your ship doesn't come in, you got to be like Noah and just build your own. (laughs) All right? So have you ever heard this, that don't let your struggle uh, become a stumbling block, turn it into a stepping stone. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today because obstacles are often opportunities for greatness. All right. So let's get into it. I got four points today. Uh, the world, and this is not the first one, but I just want to say this, the world belongs to the enthusiastic. Uh, the word enthusiasm was first mentioned by the Greeks in the book of Acts, and they, they accused the Christians of being enthusiastic. It was not a compliment. It means, enthusio, mean, theos means God. So they were saying, you are possessed by God. You are enthused or filled with Theos, God, you're enthusiastic. Well, today, we don't think of it that way, but that's what it means. It means to be possessed by God. That's not a bad thing. So let me say again, the world belongs to the enthusiastic, to to the positive. So here's point number one. And this is a philosophy that I've tried to live by for a long time now, and I simply call it this. Don't kick the donkey. Don't kick the donkey. This comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 22. Oh, hey, everybody watching us online. I didn't mean to uh, ignore you. Uh, I know you're there. I greeted you in the first service, but, but you weren't there. So anyway, hey, everybody watching us online. So glad that you're with us today. We can feel your presence virtually. We can feel your presence here. So, All right, Numbers chapter 22. This is a story about a prophet named Balaam, and he was hired by an, a king to curse the children of Israel, God's people. Well, when he went to curse God's people, he just couldn't speak anything negative about them. He could only say positive things about them. How many of you can't curse what God's blessed, right? So even if somebody curses you, you're like, ah, doesn't matter, I'm blessed. So the king said, look, you need to try harder. So he sent a payment of money to Balaam. And so Balaam was like, man, that's, that money's good. So he saddled up his donkey And he takes off, heading out to go curse God's people. Well, on his way, an angel of the Lord stands in the road and pulls out his sword. But Balaam can't see it, but the donkey does. So the donkey's like, ooh, we need to go this way. And he runs off into this field, and Balaam's like, man, what are you doing? He kicks the donkey. He goes, get back on the path. So they get back on the path, and then there's the angel again with the sword drawn. And so the... uh, 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 the donkey, he, he goes up against this wall and crushes the prophet's foot. And it just infuriates the prophet. He's just angry. He smacks the donkey and kicks him. What is stupid donkey? What is wrong with you? So giddy up. So he gets going again. And then they come to this narrow spot about to go around a curb. And there's the angel of the Lord. He's got a sword drawn. So the donkey, he just, he just sits down. And Balaam gets off. He kicks you, stupid donkey. And the Bible says that God opened the donkey's mouth and the donkey says, have I not been your donkey your whole life? And the funniest part of the story to me is that Balaam just engages in conversation like this is no big deal. He goes, yeah, you have been my donkey my whole life and you've never acted this way. And the donkey's like, duh. Of course I've never acted this way. Shouldn't this be a clue that something's up? He's like, well, what's going on? He goes, well, what you don't know is right up there, there's an angel of God. He's got a sword. He's going to cut your head off if I hadn't sat down. I saved your life. And Balaam's like, I am so sorry. So sometimes when things just don't seem to be clicking or working out like you think they should, instead of forcing it, don't kick the donkey. Just trust the process. Okay, I said it this way in, in the first service. So remember she said on the side of the building it says no perfect people allowed. So some of you need to stop kicking your own ass. Amen. That's good advice, right? So maybe that should have been point number one. But, but when things aren't working out, just quit forcing it and don't kick the donkey. Amen. Say I won't. Okay, so don't force things when they're not clicking. So, um, 
Some folks, they train themselves to find the negative in everything. But what I'm wanting you to do today, I'm wanting to inspire you to train, retrain yourself. Hey, Kim, I didn't see you sitting there. To tra- retrain yourself to find the, ne- the, the positive instead of the negative. For, for example, like this one guy he gets up and he says, he says, good morning, Lord. And another guy gets up and he says, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> so the question is, which one of those people are you? I want you to train yourself to be a good morning, Lord person, right? Amen. All right. So choose to enjoy your day. Every day. Um, in fact, learn the happy, the eight happy habits. My wife wrote a book called Happy Anyway, and she has the eight happy habits. How to happy. It's, a, it's great. If you don't have that book, get it. And in fact, her new book is coming out called Believe Anyway on September the 14th. But if you would, go ahead and order it on Amazon now because it helps go toward um, her count of uh, being like a bestseller in her category. And for some reason, you can buy five books at a time, and it count, but if you buy six books, it only counts five. Or if you buy 50 books, it only counts five. So buy them in five uh, increments of five, okay? So, and I have two kids in college, so please buy my wife's book. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, choose to enjoy your job. Don't focus on the negative things about it. Just be thankful that you have a job. I mean, you can look for a better one or believe for a better one, but be thankful that you have one. So choose to enjoy the new traffic that we have in Mobile. <laughs> I know it's tough. Um, I've, I've met some, uh, I've encountered some drivers out there, especially on Airport Boulevard. It seems like more of them speak sign language than other drivers. I don't know why. That was going to tell you that you're number one and stuff like that. But anyway, um, but whoever designed those side roads, they were smoking something, man. I don't, but, but, but anyway, but you got to choose <laughs> to enjoy your day, no matter, even if there's airport traffic. We lived off Airport Boulevard for almost 20 years. We finally moved (laughs) earlier this year. And it's a lot nicer not having to go up and down Airport Boulevard every day. But when we did, we chose to have joy anyway. And we've got like 15, 20,000 new people in Mobile because of the storms. So instead of being angry with those people, let's just be hospitable. And let's be thankful that we still have a city, that we avoided tragedy or the tragedy avoided our city and didn't come here. We we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? And so, but let's be hospitable to those that are in need right now as well. So everybody say, choose joy. joy. Amen. So uh, don't just endure your day, enjoy your day. Happiness is a choice. Isn't that right? So what will you choose? You don't. In the, in the South, we say, don't get down in the mully grubs. You know what the mully grubs are? It's, if you're in the, from the South, you know what that is. So you know, say, well, I got water in, in my house. So choose to be thankful that you didn't lose your family or your life. Uh, in the first service, I was talking about when Katrina came, um, Bill and Marilyn, they, they live over off Nazco Road. And uh, in their neighborhood, they, some ho- homes had up to eight feet of water in their houses. And so our church adopted that neighborhood and went down there and we're passing out groceries and helping people clean up and different things. And I went to check on Bill in Maryland. And they had, you know, he was, he was squeegeeing water off of his hardwood floors and they had buckled and he was ripping them out and putting new ones in. And I said, man, Bill, what can we do to help you? He goes, oh, we're fine. Go help those people that really need help. <laughs> I mean, that's a positive dude right there, man. And, uh, but he made a choice to be positive, right? So instead of thinking your blessings don't count, count your blessings. Because you probably got more than you realize. Isn't that right? Come on, somebody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Amen. Decide here and now, you're just not going to have any more bad days. Amen. Decision made. Think of Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, God's talking there, and I love what he says. He says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Oh, yeah? What kind of plans you got for me, Lord? He's like, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. I have plans to prosper you and to give you a hope. <clears throat> That's a target, right? And a future. I mean, I've discovered no matter how much a guy dreads the future, he usually wants to be there for it. <laughs> right? So choose joy. All right, here's, here's point number two. Develop the habit of being positive. Now, it's taken you a while to develop the habit of being negative, so it might take you a minute to develop a new habit, but you can do it, all right? 
There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 7 about this guy who was negative. And there, I mean, there was a famine in the land. There were some bad things going on. People were starving to death. And the prophet of the Lord came and he said, Thus saith the Lord, this time tomorrow, there's going to be an abundance of food and resources. It's gonna, and the, the king's assistant, he said, Oh, man, if God made windows in heaven, it, this couldn't come to pass. Well, what he didn't know is God did have windows in heaven. And he still does. And he pours blessings out of those windows. That's what the Bible says. But anyway, he says, if God made windows in heaven, this couldn't come to pass. And the prophet said, he goes, well, you'll see it, but you won't get to eat any of it. And the next day, there was a boom. And the economy turned around. There was an abundance. And everybody was rushing towards all this food and all this supply. And this guy got trampled in the gate and he died. Negative, how many know negativity will kill you? <laughs> negativity is a killer. Numbers chapter 13 tells a story, uh, Numbers 13, 30, about how Moses sent the spies into the promised land to check it out. And we know the story. Ten of them came back. They had a negative report. And then Joshua and Caleb, they had a positive report. So Caleb, it says, he quieted the people and he said, be quiet and listen to Moses. Hey, well, that's good advice. Some folks just need to be quiet and listen to the pastor. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I'm telling you, I'm going to get a t-shirt made one day. And it's going to say, I told you so. That's all it's going to say. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to wear the shirt. Anyway, moving right along. He, Caleb said, let's go now and take possession of the land. We should be more than able to conquer it. But the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack those people. They're too strong for us. Everybody say, if you say so. It's a little phrase I like to, when somebody says something, I go, if you say so. <laughs> that makes you realize, well, maybe I should say something different. So they began to spread lies among the Israelites about the land that they had explored. And they said, the land we explored is one that devours all those who live there. And all the people that we saw there are very tall. Now, how many know if other tall people will keep you from your destiny, I would be in big trouble. So this is not, this is a lie. This is a lie. All right, he says, we, this is the real problem in the next verse. He says, we looked as small as grasshoppers in our own sight. And we must have looked small to them. So how many know it's what you look like to yourself that really matters? That's why I want you to see yourself as God sees you. That's why when we taught on uh, God the Son, Jesus, we didn't just teach on, we, we taught on how great Jesus is, but we also taught about that you are in Christ. Now, outside of Christ, you're not much to look at, neither am I. But in Christ, you're amazing. You're amazing. We have a little saying in our house. If somebody messes up, we'll go, well, you're not perfect, but you're awesome. I know that's a lot nicer than, you idiot, what were you thinking, you know? Because <laughs> that doesn't work. But, you know, like that sailor, he got born to lose tattooed on his arm. And uh, they asked the tattoo, over, over in the Far East, they asked the tattoo artist, do a lot of guys get that tattooed, uh, a lot of sailors? And he said, uh, tattoo on mind before tattoo on arm. <laughs> so you got you, you to get that thought out of your head because it'll brand you. So Israel had formed the deadly habit of negativity, and they couldn't see themselves going in and taking possession of what God had promised them. So pessimism, it's like cancer, and it spreads unless you stop it. And the only thing that'll stop it is the Word of God, the Word of God. So you must stop negativity in your life, and you're the only one who can. Now, unfortunately, you can't really stop it in other people's lives. You can influence them and encourage them, but they have to decide that they don't want to be a negative Nelly anymore. So negative folks... Uh, they focus on the giants. Positive folks, they focus on God. So you don't look at how big the giants are, you look at how big God is. And then it doesn't matter how big the giants are, right? Because where your focus goes, the power flows. So wherever you focus, that's where, you know, where, your, where your thoughts go, your life follows as well. So that's why you got to set your mind. Set your mind. Hebrews 3.19 says, Hebrews 3.19, it says, the children of Israel, they could not enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. 
Now, it's, no, notice it says they could not. How many know unbelief will make you unable, but faith will make you more than able? They could not enter in. Why? Unbelief. So they turned an 11 day trip into a 40 year journey. <laughs> I mean, a fear and doubt and unbelief will always make things take a lot longer and be a lot harder, right? Yes. All right. So. You can retrain your brain to be positive, one thought at a time, one situation at a time. Uh, have I ever told you all about the positive farmer and the negative farmer? Well, they were neighbors, and uh, the positive farmer, he, he was like, oh, we're going to plant seed, we're going to have a bumper crop, and the negative farmer was like, well, it'll probably rain too much and wash out the seed. The positive farmer, he's like, we're probably not going to have enough room in the barn to put all the harvest. And negative farmer goes, oh, it'll probably be a drought and dry everything up. Just negative. So one day, the positive farmer, he bought this special hunting dog. And this hunting dog could walk on water, just like Jesus. So he says, I'm finally going to get a positive reaction out of my negative neighbor. So he goes, hey, let's go duck hunting. So they got out there in the duck blind and some ducks, in, of course, the negative neighbor he said oh we probably won't even see any ducks well some ducks flew over and bam 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 they shot him and he goes now watch this he says Fido fetch dog ran out ran right across the top of the water got the duck brought it back the positive farmer says what do you think about that the negative farmer says just what I thought that dog can't even swim <laughs> <laughs> he had a bad habit didn't he he was negative Negative. So Deuteronomy 28, 12 says, God will bless and prosper all the work of my hands. So hold your hands out like this and say, all the work of these hands, God prospers and blesses. Say, these are wealthy hands. Amen, if you say so. Romans 8, 5 says that the key to life and death is where your mind is set. It says that he who walks according to the flesh has his mind set on the things of the flesh, but he who walks in the Spirit, and that's where life is, he has his mind set on the things of the Spirit. Everybody say mindset. Uh, Romans 12 teaches us not to be conned and formed to the image of this world, but to be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. So when you transform your thinking, it transforms your whole life. Isaiah 26.3 says, Isaiah 26.3 says, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. We, we, uh, my son has a, a new black lab. He's about eight, nine months old. His name is Bear. He's got a big old head. He looks like a bear. And he was a cute little puppy, and now he's not little. He's still cute, though, but he's still a puppy, though. And we're teaching him to Stay. Stay. And man, he'll, he'll come, uh, you know, we, he loves to play fetch. But now we're teaching, well, we'll throw it, we'll say stay. And, and man, he's looking at it, he's like, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go. And we'll go, get it. And he'll, he'll take off. Well, oh, but he likes to go. But sometimes you got to stay. And you got to keep your mind stayed. But you got to keep it stayed where? On the Lord. The Message Bible says, people with their minds set on you, Lord. You keep completely whole, steady on their feet because they keep at it and don't quit. So it's imperative. It's imperative where your mind is set or where your mind is stayed. So it's not what's on your mind. It's what your mind is on. Isn't that right? So keep your mind stayed. What does that word stayed mean? It means to lean on, to lean on. So when you get stressed... What do you lean on? When you get angry, where does your mind go? So if you keep your... Now, you can be angry and sin not, or you can be angry and sin. <laughs> it just depends on where your mind is leaning. What are, you, what, what are you resting on? Or do you have mental habits? You, cert, you go to certain places when you get in certain conditions, when you get stressed or tempted or angry or tired, where does your mind stay? Sometimes your mind wants to, to go to these places it shouldn't go. You got to say, stay. Oh, yeah. I, 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 stay. Yes. Right? Yeah. And if you'll do this, 
The Bible promises that God will keep you in perfect peace. Now, the Old Testament was written in the book, uh, written in the language of, of Hebrew. And so in Hebrew, it says, instead of perfect peace, it says shalom, shalom. It says it twice. Now, shalom is the God kind of peace. And it means to make complete. So if you'll keep your mind stayed on the Lord, he will make you complete. He'll make you safe. He'll make you happy. He'll make you friendly. He'll make you prosperous. He'll make you healthy. He'll make you well and whole. Now, you get all that just by keeping your mind stayed on the Lord or stayed in the right place. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing hurting, completely whole and happy. It's a good deal. It's a really good deal. But it's all contingent on where your mind is stayed or what your mind is leaning on. Don't lean on the wrong thing. Lean on me when you're not strong. That's, I think that's the Lord singing to us. Sing it, girl. I'll help you carry on. Come on. Right? But you got to lean on him. Right. Don't lean on your own strength. Don't lean on your flesh. Don't lean on your emotions. Oh, Lord, Jesus, don't lean on them. They will let you down. <laughs> they are very tricky. All right? They're great servants, horrible masters. So here's an exercise. I want you to start training the negativity out and putting the positivity in. So start asking questions in a positive way. Um, I mean, everybody in sales knows you don't say, hey, you don't want to buy any of these cookies, do you? Right? They say body language is like half of your communication. So you want, so you want to, hey. So they did this experiment in the military, and um, they, they actually studied this. They had a guy stand at the front of the food line with bowls of apricots. And this is the first thing he did. He says, hey, you don't want any apricots, do you? 90% of the people said, no, I don't. Second attempt, hey, would you like some apricots? 40% of the people said, yeah, sure. But still 60% said no. Here was his third attempt. He said, uh, would you like one or two bowl of apricots? And 90% of the people took at least one bowl. Oh, I'll just take one. I'll have two. So men, you can use this to your advantage. You can say, honey, you don't want to go shopping, do you? <laughs> She'd probably say, yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work. So here's point number three, all right? So you want to train out the negativity, learn the habits of pot, learn the happy habits. Number three is break Murphy's Law. You ever heard of Murphy's Law? I don't know who Murphy was, but he must have had some bad luck. Murphy's Law says, if anything bad can happen, it will, and it'll happen to me. So we want the Messiah's Law, which is, if anything good can happen, it probably will, and it'll happen to me. I mean, good things happen all the time. Why shouldn't they happen to you? You're God's favorite. So Colossians 3.2 says, Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above. So who does the setting? You do. Turn to your neighbor and say, you set your mind. So you set your mind on things above. Remember, remember Gideon in the Bible? Man, he was a negative dude. But God turned a negative guy into a positive guy, and he saved his whole nation. So he, he appeared to Gideon. Gideon was hiding because he was afraid that his uh, enemies were going to come and steal all of his goods. And so uh, Jesus appeared to him, and he said, <clears throat> Hail, mighty man of valor. Go and save your nation. And Gideon was like, you talking to me? I think you got the wrong address, man. He's no mighty man here. He goes, and I love what Jesus, he didn't even blink. He just says, he said it again, go, mighty man, save your nation. And Gideon tries to explain it to him. You ever tried to explain to God why he couldn't use you? He's like, wait a minute. Okay, look, I am the least in my father's house. My father's house is the least in our whole tribe. Our tribe is the least tribe in our whole nation. And I don't know if you've noticed, but our nation ain't doing so hot right now either. I'm like literally the lowest guy on the total pole. And God said, uh-huh, go in this might of yours and save your nation. And so God took this total loser. He took this negative guy and turned him into a passionate, positive, faith-filled winner. How many know most winners are just ex-losers who got passionate and positive? 
So, and, and we're all kind of like tea bags. We're, we're not much good till we go through some hot water anyway. So don't despise the trials of life. Realize this is an opportunity for God to bring some really good stuff out of me that I didn't even know was in there. Albert Einstein said, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stick with problems longer than most people. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? So you got to break Murphy's Law, and that leads me to point number four, and it's simply this. It's always too soon to quit. Always too soon to quit. Um, remember Joseph in the Bible, coat of many colors, that guy? His own brothers sold him, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery at Potiphar's house, and then he got sent to prison for something he didn't do. I mean, this guy's having a bad run. And then finally, he ends up in the palace as the second in charge of the mightiest empire on the planet. So he goes from the pit to the Potiphar's to the prison to the palace. But it took a long time, about 30 years. How many know it's always too soon to quit? The word endure means to remain, to have fortitude, to patiently suffer and persevere because you know that it ain't over until it's good. All things work together for good for them who love the Lord. I mean, hey, even if you die and this life isn't all, you get a whole nother life, you get eternal life. If it doesn't work out in this one, it'll work out in the next one. Right? So failure is always waiting on the path of least resistance. So it's always too soon to quit. Be like a postage stamp. Just stick with it till you get there. <laughs> or how about Winston Churchill? That was a guy, man, he didn't have any quitting sense, did he? I mean, if it wasn't for him, we'd all be speaking German probably right now. But they invited him after World War II to come give a, a speech at, at a college graduation, and he stomped up onto the platform, and his speech went like this. Never, 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 never give up. Never. And then he picked up his hat and went and sat down. That was his whole speech. And everybody knew he meant it because he did not give up. It's not like, um, remember that movie Finding Nemo? You know, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Just. So if you don't know what to do, just keep swimming. And, and, and there's a little boy uh, after Hurricane Katrina, nine years old. His name is uh, Johnny Wilson. And he swam in the frigid, shark-infested waters from, from Alcatraz Island to San Francisco Bay to raise money for the Hurricane Katrina victims. And he raised over $30,000, this nine-year-old kid. And they asked him, they said, how did you do that? And he said, I just kept telling myself, keep swimming, I'm almost there. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> you tell yourself that, just keep swimming, I'm almost there. Just keep swimming. So if this kid can use the power of natural positive thinking to do something great, how, many know, how much more can we use the power of faith in God and his word to do greater works than Jesus did? Because he said we would. And I'm not just talking about positive, the power of positive thinking here. I'm talking about an attitude of faith in God that knows that God's word, everything else can change, but God's word can't. So we're going to believe God's word. Isn't that right? So if something's got to change, is it God's word or is it your circumstances? Your circumstances have to change because God's word can't change. It doesn't even have the ability to change. That's why he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, y'all. Ooh, that's good stuff. So... In conclusion, let me give you 12 fast thoughts on how to keep positive in a negative world. All right? Number one, if you don't quit, you don't lose. Number two, if you get knocked down seven times, how many times should you get up? Eight. Eight. That's right. Good job. Number three, the most natural thing to do when you get knocked down is what? Get up. Number four, it's always too soon to quit. Should you quit? Nope, it's too soon. Number five. Change, I can't win for losing to I can't lose for winning. Born to win. Number six, look on the bright side. Even if you have to go hunt it down. <laughs> Number seven, never take advice from your fears. Number eight, don't jump into trouble mouth first. Some people have the foot and mouth disease. 
All right, number nine. Remember, the faith to move mountains always carries a pickaxe. Number 10, doors of opportunity are always marked push. Number 11, face the music and you'll end up leading the band. And number 12, God's not your problem. He's your solution. Amen? Amen. Let me give you three fast scriptures. Bonus material. Romans 8.38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height or depth nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What then shall we say in response to these things? I don't know. You've got to say something. If God is for us, who can be against us? I like what one translation says. If God is for us, doesn't even matter who's against us. Isn't that good? Yeah. Psalm 145, 18 says, Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. All you got to do is call. Call unto me and I will answer you, the Bible says, Jeremiah 33, 3. And then finally, James 4, 8 says, James 4, 8, it says, come near to God and God will come near to you. Here's the Pastor Kevin translation. You take one step towards God and he'll take a thousand towards you. Yes, he He's just that good. So, you ready to change your outlook? Because I know things might look rough, but God is working behind the scenes on your behalf. Because he loves you. And I don't know if I've told you this lately, but you're his absolute favorite. Amen. <laughs> You say, well, how can we all be his favorite? Well, have you ever been to Baskin Robbins? <laughs> They're all my favorite, so I mean, God can have more than one favorite. And he loves you and you're his favorite. So he's working it out. He's working things together for your good. Amen? So just know that. Know that. And keep your mind stayed on him. He'll keep you in perfect peace. So the, the, the step to to change in your outlook is changing your mindset. But before that, you got to change where your heart is set. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, man, that is the most important decision and mindset and shift that you'll ever make. Because when you call on the name of Jesus to be saved or born again, the Bible says you become a brand new creature and you're made, you're already made in the image of God, but then you're spiritually alive. You're spiritually filled with and connected to God. And that changes everything. So I'm going to pray for us today. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment before we go? If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to lead you in the prayer of salvation. If you're watching us online today and you need to pray this prayer, please let us know down in the comments. We have hosts there online on YouTube, Facebook, and HarvestMobile.com. They're there to minister to you and to serve you. But if you're here in the room or online and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm not going to make you stand up or come forward or anything like that today, but if you would like to be born again, invite the Spirit of God to live on the inside of your heart to, for Jesus to be your Lord, then would you just let me know who I'm praying with today and just raise your hand and say, hey, that's me. I'm praying this prayer. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life today. If you're online, in the room, looking all around, if everybody's family, that's awesome. That means we need to invite people to church, y'all. But let's all pray. In case there's somebody that doesn't have the courage to raise their hand today, let's all pray together. Would you just say this with me today? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I, repent I repent of my sin, and I call on Jesus to save me. I believe with all my heart he died for my sin, and they buried him. But on the third day, you raised him from the dead. And I'm saying, Jesus, raise me from the dead right now. Fill me with your spirit and give me power to live this new life in Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. We're so excited. Heaven's having a party and we want to just rejoice with you as well.